Open up your Bibles, if you will, to Mark chapter 4. And if you won't, I think you're in the wrong place. Mark chapter 4. And Lord, again, I ask that you would bless your word. That we would hear in this teaching what you want us to hear. Not the words of man, but the words of Christ by your spirit. And Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be open before you. Uh, that our hearts would be rich, soft soil to receive the seed implanted in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 1. He began to teach again by the sea. And such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. We begin and end tonight, chapter 4, with... Jesus, the rabbi on a rowboat. We start with him in a boat teaching, and we will end with him in a boat uh, saving. And it's a marvelous chapter, and it's one of those where a couple of the parables may be familiar to you. We're going to hit the parables for the first time tonight in the book of Mark. And uh, they may be familiar, but I know I found some things that I hadn't seen before, and I hope we can share those together. Jesus by the Sea of Galilee. This picture to me is so vivid. First time I went to Israel, the most impressive thing to me was being on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And now every time we go to Israel, that's a favorite experience of our group. Hop on the Jesus boat and head out into the middle of the Galilee. And once we get out there, they turn the engines off. And we sit there in the silence. You can hear the water lapping up against the sides of the boat. And we will worship and pray there on on the Galilee. It's just profound. And then open up the word, typically to some story that happened there on the Galilee or by the sea, and we read that together and we share it. Well, that's where we're going tonight. In fact, I invite you to climb on board and listen to the great rabbi teach. Verse 2 says, He was teaching them with many things in parables and was saying to them in His teaching, Listen! Behold, the sower went out to sow. Now before we get to the sower, another word about the Sea of Galilee. It sits like a bowl, surrounded by hills and mountains all the way around the Galilee down in the center of it. And you've got some that are sharp crags and cliffs that go up, but other parts where the land just rolls gently up away from the Galilee. Most of that around there is farmland. Those gently rising slopes are very rich soil. And they grow all manner of things in Israel, not as much as the Sharon Valley, but around the Galilee, it's it's amazing to drive on that road surrounding the Galilee and to see all that's there, all kinds of produce, citrus and, and melons and dates and pomegranates and even pineapple and banana, and all of this grows around the sea. So as Jesus stands on the boat, you can imagine this, the people are all around the shoreline, dozens, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of them, and they're all around the shoreline. And as we talked about last week, with Jesus on the water and the people on the shoreline, there would be a natural amplification. They could hear very well what he was saying. But Jesus could see all around, even behind the people, and would be noting the farmlands. And Jesus, being the the marvelous rabbi, the wonderful teacher that he is, used all these things to explain the truth. He often would do that. That's what the parables are, using external things to explain internal things. And so with this first parable in the Gospel of Mark, he says, listen, behold, the sower went out to sow. I don't know if there was someone sowing in that moment, possibly. But a sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And you can see some of the people standing around listening to this going, oh yeah, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. That's, that's good farming right there. Other seed, well it says after the sun had risen, verse 6, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed, verse 7, fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked it and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and a hundredfold. And he was saying to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, 
To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, those who are outside get everything in parables. So that while seeing they may not perceive and while hearing they may hear and not understand. Otherwise they might return and be forgiven. So the apostles get alone with Jesus. They don't have 2,000 years of Bible teaching behind them. They just have the moment. They've just heard the parable of the sower and the soils for the first time. And they're listening. And they get the farming aspect of it. But beyond that, what's he talking about? And so they ask Jesus, what are you talking about here? They don't get it. They know there's something deeper. But they also ask him, why, Jesus, do you teach in parables? Before we go any further, three reasons. There may be more. But three specific reasons that I can think of that Jesus taught in parables. Three essential reasons. Number one, to conceal the truth. Jesus taught in parables to conceal the truth from those who didn't want to hear it. He spoke in such a way that if you were not interested in the truth, if you were not interested in the things of God, if you didn't want to know about actual truth, then you wouldn't get any further than the surface. He literally taught to conceal the truth from those who didn't want it. It's kind of nice of Jesus. He respects the person's position. I don't want your truth. Okay. Then you're not going to get it. He also taught in parables to reveal the truth to those who had ears to hear, to those who were hungry for the truth, who really wanted to know, what does God's word teach about this? How do we walk with the Lord? How do we relate? How does faith grow? The Greek word for parable, parabole, para means alongside, balo means to throw. So literally, a parable is something that you throw alongside. To throw alongside, it's an illustration or a story that you throw alongside using a known truth, you throw alongside an unknown truth. And so Jesus does this. He throws known realities alongside unknown mysteries to explain the unknown mysteries by the known realities. And it's a marvelous tool for teaching, and Jesus was an absolute master of it. But that very method of revelation also conceals the truth, again, to those who don't want to hear it. Proverbs 25, verse 2, tells us it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. You want to be noble-minded, like the people, the Bereans? If you want to be noble-minded, you search, you dig, you want to know more. You seek to understand more of the truth of God. That's noble thinking. That's what kings do. That's their honor. It's God's honor to conceal a thing, and so people have to respond with faith to understand those things. So the parable works both ways, to conceal and to reveal, but there's a third way, and it's very important, and Mark truly illuminates this for us more, I think, than any of the other gospel accounts. It's to heal with the truth. To heal with the truth. Jesus explains this this, uh, dynamic further by applying the words of Isaiah chapter 6. And I want you to keep your finger in Mark 4 and go back to Isaiah 6. I know we just studied Isaiah, but I believe it was about nine months ago we were in Isaiah 6. So go back and look again. Jesus in Mark 4.12 is quoting directly from Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10. Now you might note it's not going to be word for word because Jesus isn't trying to give a word for word quote, word for word quote. He's giving an application. Okay? He's applying Isaiah's commission. Isaiah by this time in chapter 6 of Isaiah had been called by God. Now he is being commissioned by God. He's being told by the Lord, here's what I want you to go do. Listen to this. I heard a voice, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send who will go for us? And then I said, Isaiah speaking, here I am. Send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now, understand, it's not that God doesn't want the people to return and be healed. He's pointing out through Isaiah, here's the condition of your heart. And your hearts are not seeing and your hearts are not hearing. And and you're not going to be healed. The only way to be healed is to return to me and to see with your heart. And to hear also with your heart. But there's a significant difference 
between Mark's account of Jesus applying this verse and all others. And it's fascinating to note this. Again, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, render the hearts of this people insensitive. Their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now, Matthew quotes Jesus, quoting Isaiah, perfectly. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. John quotes correctly. John chapter 12, verse 40. They would not see with their eyes, perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. Acts 28, verse 27. Paul quotes Jesus quoting Isaiah, (laughs) saying, Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. And in every case, Isaiah's prophecy, his original prophecy is quoted correctly, God saying, I would heal them. But Mark turns the phrase differently. Mark hears, or perhaps Peter, if Mark is teaching from Peter's teaching, either way, the Holy Spirit inspires Mark to write it this way, while seeing they may see and not perceive, while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Mark's the only one who uses the word forgiven. He doesn't use the word healed. Why suddenly, is this a contradiction? Is this a problem in Scripture? Did some scribe come along and mess this up? Absolutely not. Bible students, I think you get this, you understand this, that forgiveness is healing. That without forgiveness, you truly don't have healing. It doesn't work without forgiveness. It's one of those profound biblical truths. That was the whole point that we saw in Mark chapter 2 of Jesus' work with the paralytic, healing him first. And then raising him up to walk. Then giving him the power to walk. He said in Mark 2 verse 9, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. Forgiveness is healing. And I believe that if the paralytic never had gotten up off the pallet, if Jesus had never offered that physical healing to him, he would have yet been more healed than he had ever imagined he could be because he was forgiven. His heart was truly healed by the Lord. You know this. If you've ever been in a relationship that was broken and you were forgiven and the relationship was healed or you forgave someone, it's a hard thing to do. It takes all of our pride being taken out of the way for us to be able to forgive. But this this forgiveness of Jesus, don't forget, is supernatural. Because it's not forgiveness for the moment. It's not even forgiveness for the lifetime. It is forgiveness for eternity. And he says, if you will hear with your ears, if you will see with your eyes, if you will understand with your heart and turn to me, repent, turn around to me, I will forgive you which is the ultimate of all healing. Psalm 103, verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So the parables are to conceal, they are to reveal, and they are given to heal. Jesus uses all three aspects of this. Now the parable of the sower, again, is the first one in Mark's account, and that is not by chance. It's not accidental. It's not that Mark just was trying to remember the parables. Oh, yeah, let's do that one first. I believe it's here on purpose because this parable is the key to all the others. If you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand the rest of the parables. In fact, Jesus says as much. In verse 13, he says, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? What he's saying here is this parable explains how the word gets into the heart. And if the word doesn't get into the heart, Jesus asks, how will we understand the parables? So we start right here with Jesus explaining how the word gets in. Verse 14, his explanation to the apostles, which we hear with them tonight. The sower sows the word. Okay, so we know right off the bat the seed is the word. Very clear. And as Jesus explains, the soil now is going to represent the quality of the heart. And he now describes four kinds. Verse 15. These are the ones 
who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. I call this soil number one, road heart. This is road heart. Heavily traveled, packed down, hard pan heart. Nothing gets in. So that when the word is cast on this heart, it's immediately taken away. Satan grabs hold of it and makes off with it. It's the soil of the seared conscience. It's the soil that just can't get God's word in. It doesn't get beyond the surface at all. It doesn't even penetrate. Not in the least. And many of the Pharisees suffered from road heart. And we see this in their interactions with Jesus. Why and how they suffered from road heart. They had the word. Right? I mean, they were the guardians of the word. Thank God for the Jewish people. Paul refers in Romans chapter 9 to this, that one of the things that they did was protect the word for us all these many years. They were fierce champions of God's word, of Torah law, of the prophets. They kept the scrolls. They guarded the scrolls. They nitpicked the scrolls, but they took care of all of this. It mattered so much to them, the word, the word, the word. But their problem was, the word to them was all about law and doctrine, and never about love and devotion. And that's where they missed it. And that's why, rather than having hearts softened by the word, they had hearts that had become hardened. They had the word, but they couldn't see the word. What do you mean? John 5.39 says you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, Jesus says. Hebrews 10.7, and I know I always use these three verses together, but I'm going to continue to do so. Hebrews 10.7, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, Jesus says. Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And if we approach the Bible any other way than but looking for Jesus in the word, the word in the word, the living word in the written word, we will miss the meaning of the word. In fact, this word can even harden your heart if you're not looking for Jesus with love and devotion. You're not approaching it to know him better. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4 just for a second. Hebrews chapter 4. And you might note this, the verse isn't up there behind me, but I just thought about this, talking with a brother this morning. It tells us in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Now, I mentioned Sunday that all aspects of who we are, the the trinity, if you will, of humanity is mentioned in this verse. Uh, Piercing, as far as the division of soul, that is our, our soul man, our mentality, our intellect, and spirit, that is who we really are. And even joints and marrow, our physical selves. All three mentioned, soul, spirit, and, and body. But note this, and I have done this many, for many years in ministry. I use this verse to hold up the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active. It is. It gets in there. It's incisive. It cuts. It does what needs to be done. What's the Word of God? Jesus is the Word of God. It shouldn't even be a what question. It's a who question. Look at the next verse. And there is no cr- creature hidden from His sight. Whose sight? The Word's sight. Wait a minute, my Bible's looking at me? No, Jesus is. Because He is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. And so, He is the one who is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword. We know out of His mouth in Revelation comes the sharp two-edged sword. Right? He's the Word. And this Word that we have in our hands, the Bible proclaims Jesus from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to the very end of Revelation. It is all about Jesus. It is for Jesus. And road hearts cannot receive the word implanted because they miss that the word is Jesus. And if we go to the word looking for Jesus, our hearts are softened, the soil is good, and we receive the word. The Pharisees didn't do that. They went to the word for the word. That is the written word. I love the Bible, by the way. I love the stories. I love the commands. I believe, actually, that that you can read this and have your life altered and changed simply by being obedient to what it says. 
But to truly have the Word get in and change you eternally, you've got to be looking for Jesus. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.3, If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he's conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. That's exactly what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees did. They disputed about words. They argued over meaning. And they missed Jesus when the word came in flesh. I'll tell you, gang, that the Pharisees are a cautionary tale to all of us. To anyone who would make scripture about scripture rather than seeing scripture being about Jesus Christ. And the danger is that if you look at scripture without Jesus, it will harden you. Verse 16. Back in Mark 4, verse 16. In a similar way, now we get to the next soil, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Soil number two, the rocky heart. So we have road heart, now we've got rocky heart. And don't start thinking, it's not victorious. The rocky heart. Imagine, picture, immediate green shoots just springing up out of this soil, but without any root system. So when the heat of the sun burns down or a strong wind blows, they just come right out and they're done. And that's the description. In fact, uh, in this area, in in the Middle East, the ground oftentimes had hard limestone only a few inches beneath it. There were areas even there around the Galilee that were not well farmed because you couldn't. You tried to plant and you'd hit limestone. And so, again, the description is very apropos as as Jesus is teaching. The people would know, yeah, I tried to plant something. It just blew away. The rocky heart. And it's a perfect picture of superficial religion. Religion that's about showing up. It's about attendance. It's about, you know, works. Superficial religion. You might ask the question, well, okay, how do I develop deep roots then? I don't want to have superficial religion. I don't want to have roots that only go down just so far and then I get blown away. Faith, Romans 10, 9 tells us, comes from hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. Hearing by the word of Christ. Literally in the Greek, if you were reading that, it says hearing by the word Christ. And as we just talked about, the word is Christ. Faith comes by hearing the word Christ. What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying if you invite the word Christ into you, then get into the word of Christ, his word will get implanted deeply in your life. Invite Christ in, get into Christ. Again, we're all focused on Jesus here. But the rocky heart doesn't get far enough. The rocky heart might come to a nice service and think, hey, this is kind of cool. And I see that it's good for the kids. (laughs) So I'll do this. But the roots don't go deep. And when it gets tough, and by the way, it will. The Bible tells us there's no firm root. When affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Note that. Persecution because of the word makes a person say, oh, well, maybe I don't want this word. (laughs) This word's too hard. This word's now causing me trouble. I oppose those preachers who stand up and say, come to Jesus and life will be good. The truth is, and many of you know this, come to Jesus and your life could take a turn for the worse. You'll have more joy than you've ever had in your life. But it might not get better. Or it may get marvelously better and then get bad later on. And then get better again and then be bad. You know, There's no guarantee that this life, this temporal life, is going to be great. The guarantee is that it's going to be joyful all the way into eternity, which, by the way, will be great. But we're told by Paul in 1 Timothy 3.12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You're going to face it. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be picked on. You're going to face tribulation. You're even going to deal with wrath in this life, but not God's wrath. You'll deal with the wrath of Satan. He gets a little unruly sometimes. You'll deal with the tribulation that he brings. It's his persecution that we have to deal with. 
First Thessalonians 5, 9 tells us, you Bible students know God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. By the way, i got to give you a little, quick little side note. If you die in Christ, or if you are alive in Christ when He calls us home, you're saved. You're good. You're not stuck here. I, actually, I had a brother, a faithful servant, good guy. I was talking to him just a couple of days ago, and, and he made the comment. It kind of shocked me. He said, well, not everybody's going to go up when Jesus catches us up, right? Not everyone's going. I mean, some Christians are going, I don't have any guarantee that I'm going, do I? <laughs> are you serious? And he was serious. He goes, no, I didn't. I mean, is there a guarantee? I said, my friend, open your Bible <laughs> to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will meet them in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. If you are in Christ, when he calls, you're going home. And that is an absolute guarantee. No one's going to get, you know who's going to be left behind? Unbelievers. Those who have rejected Christ. Those who deny Christ. Not, so, so take comfort in that. In fact, Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another with these words. They would not be words of comfort if we were stuck here to go through God's wrath. But He has not destined us for wrath, but for salvation. It makes no sense for God to give grace and then drag his people through tribulation to prove themselves. Grace is because we can't prove ourselves. And so he gives us grace that we don't deserve, but that he has given us by his decision, by his choice. Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Jesus said in Revelation 3.10, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on earth. He's talking about God's wrath. He's talking about the tribulation. Keep the word of my perseverance. Hang in there with me. And you will not go through that. Again, who of the whole world is going to be tested? Those who have not kept the word of his perseverance. But if you are in Christ, when he calls, you go. So be comforted by that. Soil number three. Soil number three, verse 18. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But, note this, the worries of the world. The deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Soil number three is the restricted heart. The restricted heart. We need to pay close attention to this one because of these first three soils, I think this is the biggest problem Christians face. It's not that we have an issue with road hearts, the heart pan of road hearts. If you love Jesus, that, that kind of takes care of itself. And it's not that most believers in Christ have rocky hearts, that superficiality. Some, some do. Hopefully they get beyond that. They grow beyond it. But restricted hearts, this is an issue among Christians. Now, go over to Luke 14. Luke 14. I've got to show you another parable that parallels this a bit because Jesus does this amazing definition of the restrictive flow in this heart. This is what the restricted heart looks like. In Mark, he says it's those who have, it's the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire of other things that chokes out the word. Listen to this parable. Luke 14, verse 15. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This is what I would call a blurter. Okay. What? No, I didn't say your name. Spencer, I didn't say. Verse 16. I, I don't know what drew me to just turn it. I don't know why. Just... 
happened to look your I need to leave. No, you're good. You just stay right there. You're good. It's a good thing that he blurts out, though. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Verse 16. <laughs> a man was giving a big dinner, Jesus says, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. That's a great excuse. I'm going to look at my land. How long does that take, dude? Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. At dinner time? And then... He says, please consider me excused. Another one said, I've married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. What, you can't bring her? (laughs) And the slave came back and reported to his master. And then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. That's us. (laughs) Poor, crippled, blind, and lame. Feeling better about yourself. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and there is still room. Look around. Is there still room in here? Okay, there shouldn't be. And I don't say that as a guilt trip to anyone. I take this on my own heart. I pray this constantly. Lord, every chair filled, standing room only, a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth service on Wednesday night. That's my heart's desire. Fill the place up. And the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Why tell you that parable? Because these are the kinds of excuses that do nothing but restrict the one making excuses from experiencing the joy of the feast. The guy with the oxen or the land or the wife, they are restricting themselves from the joy. They are missing out on the master's joy that he has for them. Come have the feast. It's it's not going to cost you anything. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be the time of your life. Come on in. And they go, I'm busy. The worries of life. I got things going on. I've got got five yoke of oxen now. The deceitfulness of riches. I have a desire for other things. The wife. And it becomes... A choking of the word, Jesus says. Restricted hearts. We restrict ourselves from the very freedom and feasting that God has welcomed us to. That He has invited us into. Come and dine with me. Come and enjoy the joy of of your Master. And it happens when we get too wrapped around the axle of the inconsequential material matters of this life. That do not compare... And you sitting here tonight understand that. And as I've said many times, I know on Wednesday nights, many people hit the ground running and they come home from work, they grab a bite and they're back over here as fast as they can and they come here and they sit down and it may be the first time all day long, all week long, that you've actually sat. And I've had people say, and I was exhausted when I walked in the barn and afraid I was going to pass out, you know, during worship. And then you start to feast. And you start to hear the word of the Lord. And you start to get caught up in the prayers of the saints. And you fellowship. And when you walk out, you're more filled than when you came in. And that's just a a weak little example. That's just, actually that's a once a week example is what that is. It's tiny. It doesn't even compare to the feast that God offers. And yet, Christians will do this. We will restrict our own hearts from being able to receive the word because we are too busy too caught up in this deceit of riches, too interested or desiring in other things that will not last. They're all going to burn anyway. This will not burn. Human lives caught up with Jesus are eternal. All these other things choke out the effectiveness of the Word. One of the things you might ask yourself if you're having trouble with Bible study, trouble understanding the Word of God, trouble getting into the Word, ask yourself, how is your schedule? Something as simple as that. Maybe you need to loosen it up a tad. We talked about a couple Sunday mornings ago. How many of you have started early morning devotions? Don't raise your hand, but I'm just asking rhetorically. How many have started meeting God in the morning for prayer? And if you haven't, why not? Well, Rick, you don't understand. Let me, let me tell you about my morning, Rick's morning. The alarm goes off at 6.30, and we are getting little ones ready for school. Naomi's got to be out the door by 7.30. Hayden and Anna Marie, they've got to be showered, dressed, and ready for breakfast at 7.30. Cheryl's running like, you know, a banshee around the house. And I'm trying to get just myself ready, which is enough trouble. 
and, and the, you know, we hit the ground running. I don't have time. I don't have the energy to get up earlier so that I can devote time to the Lord. Well, guess what I've just done? I've restricted my heart from feasting with God. And that's the deal. It's not a guilt trip thing, and it's not that someone who gets up for early morning devotions is more spiritual than you are. But I tell you one thing, they'll be more filled. They'll enjoy more of the fellowship of the Father that will then run throughout the entire day. The restricted heart. But there's another quality of heart soil. This is the one we want, and it is the reproductive heart. Number four, the reproductive heart, verse 20. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word, and they accept it, and bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Soil number four, the reproductive heart. And Jesus said three things happen right off the bat when the seed sinks into this rich, loamy soil. The word is heard. Not just listened to. It's heard. The word is accepted. That is, the transplant has worked. Now it, it, it's, it's, it's received. And thirdly, the word bears fruit. Understand what that means. The 30, 60, and 100-fold crop does not refer to your well-being and mine. The Word bears fruit. I'm feeling productive today because I was in the Word. I'm a productive Christian today. No, you're not, you fruit. (laughs) The Word bears fruit in you, and the fruit that it bears, listen, is other well-sown hearts. What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying the good soil now becomes the sower. You might know it at the very outset of this, verse 14, I said, the sower sows the word. Originally in my notes I had, who is the sower? Jesus, of course. Jesus sows the word. He's the sower of the word, and he is the word, so he's the sower and the word. But guess what? The rich, deep heart that accepts and receives the word of God, Jesus, that heart now becomes a sower of the word of God on other hearts. And the crop that comes in, the 30, 60, 100 fold, are other people saved. Because you and I have received the word implanted. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what Jesus is describing here through this whole thing. And yet, I I think maybe we're more like the old hymn. Are you sowing the seeds of the king, dumb brother? King, dumb brother? (laughs) That's right up there with there's a gland beyond my liver. But we won't sing that right now. (laughs) The gospel of Jesus Christ is the seed that we sow. And the fruit, as Paul writes, the produce of the word sown in us, the produce is not that we live happy, slappy lives. It's that now we are sowing the seed. We are now producing more seed which is being scattered on more hearts and more lives and those hearts are coming to Jesus as well. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, this is written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. That's what we do. That's what bearing the gospel is all about. That's our produce. The seed is sown into us and we become sowers of the seed. And that may happen via a simple conversation you have with someone about Jesus and you don't even realize you're scattering seed. It may happen when someone at work begins to ask questions and you say, you know, we could bring Bibles and and talk about this tomorrow at lunch. It might happen in opening up your home in a small group. It could happen on a Facebook post. I made fun of Facebook last week. I give you a positive spin this week. Okay? However, whenever, whatever, wherever, sow the seed. In fact, Jesus goes on to emphasize the point coming out of that parable. He says, verse 21, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? It is not to be put on the lampstand. Nothing is hidden except to be revealed. Nor has anything been secret but that it would come to light and stay in the context of the crop, of the seed. The seed goes in there. The farmer doesn't go, not so hidden. Let's just keep it that way. Hide the seed. Don't let the seed sprout up. No, the whole point of the seed implanted is that it would sprout and grow and be seen. 
and be revealed and come to be understood for what it is. Jesus is saying so loud and clear, front end of his public ministry, in the very first parable, he's saying, get the word out. Be a sower yourself. Don't be so concerned just about your heart that, am I getting well sown? Yes, you are. You get the word out. You be a sower of the seed. Allow the little seeds to see the light of day like a candle or a lamp in a house that you would set up. You don't hide that. James 1.17. Listen to this. It's kind of cool. James writes, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. I like that verse. We've used that verse before. God is just such a gracious giver. And any good thing in your life, in fact, I'll say believer or not, any good thing in your life, it's because God is gracious. But why does James call him the Father of lights? What are the lights? Are they constellations? He's the father of all... Well, I, you could say that he's the father of all constellations because, of course, he said, let there be light, and there was light. And then he divided the light the day and the night, and then he scattered the stars and the sun he placed in the, in the heavens. So you could say, well, father of the constellations. I don't think that's it. Well, father of the angels, then, because they're compared to stars, right? No. The saints who have gone before, maybe? Father of lights, maybe they're all lit up because they're in heaven. No. I think the context tells us what the lights are. The lights are the gifts. Every good and perfect gift, every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. The lights are the gifts. But if the gifts given to us, if we don't use our spiritual gifts, our abilities, our talents, anything the Lord has given to us, if we're not turning it around and using it, We're putting it under a a lamp, under a bushel, under a bed. He says, get the word out. Let your little light shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Our gifts are not lights to be hidden. They are to be used. They're not to be shelved or ignored. They're to be bright. Paul says in Philippians, shining like stars in the universe. This is how we are to live. With that in mind... Jesus gives two more gardening tips for cultivating a deep, rich, loamy, fruitful heart. I like that word loam. It just doesn't it just sound like good earth, you know? Verse 24, he says, Take care what you listen to. So I need to get rid of my Beatles records? Is that I know that's totally old school. I don't even know what, you know, today. Remember that back in back in the 60s? Any of you guys remember the Beatles records burning stuff, that whole thing? Christian groups got together and had bonfires of Beatles albums and stuff like that. Now, how, many of, how many of you now have them on your iPods? Don't tell me. <laughs> Here's the thing. He's not saying take care what you listen to as in turn off that rock and roll or stop watching that show. Now, you may need to do that. But it's interesting wording here. Take care. Take care is the Greek word blepo. Not one of the Marx Brothers. <laughs> Groucho, Blepo, Harpo. No, Blepo is an interesting word to be used here. It's translated take care, but Blepo means to see. To see. See what you listen to. Gardening tip number one, Jesus says, see to what you hear. See to it. Consider it. Think about it. He's not talking about the bad things you hear. He's talking about the good things you hear. See to what you hear. Right now, you are sitting here hearing the word of God. Jesus would say to you and to me tonight, see to it. Don't go home, close the word and go, well, that was fun. What's on you know, the schedule for tomorrow? See to the word you hear tonight. There will be something, I don't know what it is for each and every one of us, but you will go home and there's going to be something God is checking in your spirit or God is clicking in your heart and you need to pray that tonight before you go to bed. Lord, this one thing really struck me and I'm not sure why. Can you help me understand that? See to what you hear. Look into it. Meditate on it. Think about the word. Ponder it. Consider it. And then apply it. That's gardening tip number one. Gardening tip number two, he goes on and says, By your standard of measure... It will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. 
For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. The context, remember, is the seed, the word. The measure here that he's talking about, your standard of measure, is the standard of, of, of understanding of the word that you have. And if you are giving it away, guess what? He's going to continue pouring it into you. And the more you give away, the more you measure out to others, the more God is going to pour into you. You cannot outmeasure God when it comes to His truth pouring into your life. You give it out, He'll fill you up. And you'll have more to give out. So you give that out, and He'll fill you up. And He keeps this process going. Gardening tip number two, use it or lose it. Because that's the downside of this. Whoever has... To him more shall be given. But whoever does not have even what he has shall be taken away from him. Picture the seed on the hard pan road heart and Satan pictured by the little birds coming over and just picking them away and taking off. You won't even have that little amount. So we increase in the word. See to what you hear and use it or lose it. Now, The next two parables Jesus gives are short little parables, back to back. You could almost call them a miniature State of the Union address, or better better said, State of the Kingdom address. Two parables, the State of the Kingdom. The first of these two little parables is only found in the Gospel of Mark. You won't see it in any of the other Gospel accounts. And this first one made my day today. This put a smile on my face. Let me ask you this question. How many of you, and we can see a show of hands here, ever get discouraged in the larger church? You look around, you see what's happening in the church, you see perhaps what's going on in the Episcopal Church. With Bishop Gene Robinson in his new book, that is God is All About Love. Because Bishop Gene Robinson is homosexual and wants to approve his gay partner. You look at what's happening in denominational Christianity, in the Methodist Church, in the Presbyterian Church, and across the board, in so many churches that are waffling because of culture and trying to be relevant to culture instead of just being true to the Word of God. You see dumb things being said, sometimes by Christian people on the news, and you go, oh, that's not going to look good for us, you know? And you almost just want to walk in the bar and close the door behind you and go, okay, we understand each other, right? (laughs) Paul felt that way a lot. In fact, he put it this way, 2 Corinthians 11, 28, apart from external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Paul the missionary, going from church to church to church, some that he planted, some that he just went to encourage, and as he goes from one to the other, he sees their problems, he sees their issues, he sees the false teaching, he sees their tribulations, and he aches for every single church. And I've told you before, I just ache for one. You know, I'm concerned just about this one, this fellowship. This is is the area that God said, Rick, I want your focus to be. And this can get heavy. Don't get me wrong, I'm not burning out. I love it. I love our fellowship. But that daily concern, that burden, you look around and I I shared with a friend this morning. Sometimes I wonder if the last great revival is behind us. Not that the great return of Jesus isn't before us. But I really do wonder sometimes. I would love to see another revival in America. I would love to see another mass revival on planet Earth. I'm not sure that we will. Current state of things, the state of the kingdom. I look around and I think, wow. Maybe we've already seen the best that it's going to be and we just need to hang on until Jesus comes. If you ever have felt that way, listen as Jesus describes two things here, two different parables, the spiritual state of the kingdom. The spiritual state of the kingdom, verse 26. And he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil, staying with this picture. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, 
and then the head, and then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Let me tell you all a secret. Please don't tell anyone else I told you this. As I record this. Here's the secret. I really don't know what I'm doing. I, yeah. Woohoo! It's like getting on a roller coaster you've never been on before, and off you go, and you don't even know what's in the next turn. How many loops we're going to hit next time around? Are we going straight down into the ground or straight up a mile high? I have no idea. I really don't know. I don't know how this works. I sat there Sunday morning, and we were talking about the man with the shriveled hand in Mark chapter 3. You know, stretch out your hand. Couple your faith, your willingness to obey God with His power. Right? You know what I was thinking while I was preaching that? I'm looking at you all and I'm going, is anybody going to do this? Is anybody going to apply this in their life? Is anybody going to stretch out their hand? Not because I think you all are so disobedient. That's not it at all. But oftentimes, I'll be sitting here preaching or teaching and saying, are these just words? How does this work? I don't know how... When we started with 20 people in the living room, how in four months when we had our first Sunday morning in this barn, there were 60 people here. I don't know how that happened. Conversely, I don't know how we don't just explode. If the Spirit's at work and the Word is taught, I just, I just, I don't get it. I don't know how to grow people. <laughs> I mean, I'm really trying to inspire confidence. <laughs> and me here. I don't know how you grow a church physically. I don't know how you grow a church spiritually. I have no tricks of the trade. I have no training for planting churches. When my brother and I planted a church over in Anacortes several years ago. I had no idea what we were doing. So I decided I'll do it again. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. Here's what I do know. And by the way, I don't know a thing about farming. Here's what I do know. I know there's life in the seed. I know there's life in the seed. And I know that God said, Isaiah 55, 10, As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so my word will be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. I know there's life in the seed. And I know 2,000 years ago, the seed first began to fall on hearts. And you know what? 2,000 years later, it's still producing. It is still working. I don't know how. I don't get it. I don't understand other than I know there is power in the Spirit of God. And I know He gets His Word in. And I know He changes life. I just don't know how. I'm like the farmer looking at the ground going, we drop the seed in there. I know it's, something's going to happen. How does it happen? Huh? No idea. That's the spiritual state of the kingdom, and it is so encouraging to me because the kingdom is growing spiritually. God is growing lives all around us, and the harvest is coming. Now, many harvests have come across the past two millennia. Many different times there have been massive harvests of souls. And as far as I know, as far as you know, we at the bridge could be a week or two away from a huge harvest. Seeds are in the ground. Are they going to... We may be moments away from the final harvest. You know? And that's the one I'm looking forward to. But the spiritual state of the kingdom is that it is growing, yet unseen. It is growing until it becomes what it eventually will Become, But note this, the parable doesn't just work for the larger kingdom. It also works for each individual citizen as well. What do you mean? Spiritual growth. Kingdom-wide or deep inside is a process. You don't harvest a soul before it's ready. You know, the farmer doesn't see the blade pop up out of the ground and go, Get the sickle! <laughs> You know, the farmer sees the blade and he knows, all right, we're on the way. And then he sees the head and goes, okay, we're close. And then the grain. 
And then the field filled with grain. And then Jesus says he goes and gets the sickle because now it's harvest time. Here's, here's what I mean by this. Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.22, Do not lay hands on anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. What does that mean? It means don't throw someone into spiritual leadership when they're a blade. It means the reality among all of us in the fellowship of believers is that there are some blades, there are some heads, and there's some grain. Various places of maturity. All of us under grace. All of us saved by Jesus. All of us equally loved by God the Father. But all of us in different places of growth and maturity within the church body. And that's the way the kingdom grows. And it's a marvelous thing. You don't see a blade of wheat and run for the sickle. You wait for the harvest. And that means we look for the harvest in one another. And we wait for the larger harvest. So all that to be said, what is the key to farming? Is it knowing how to grow a church? No. It is faithfulness to what God calls us to. Period. And this is what my friend, it was Ray, Ray Remp this morning said to me, Rick, all you have to do is what you're doing. Just be faithful. And don't worry about the harvest because whether another harvest comes in terms of like a revival or something or Jesus comes back. Just be faithful. And that goes for every single one of us. Be faithful to what He has called you to. And don't worry about the result. He'll take care of that. Every great revival in 2,000 years of church history did not happen because the people planned it. It happened because the Spirit came upon them. It happened because God said, harvest time. And the people, every single time, were amazed and surprised. So don't worry about the harvest. You just keep to the work. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God is causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. He has called you and me to faithfully plant, sow that seed, faithfully water, and faithfully wait. The harvest will come. When will it come? When the time is ripe. When the Spirit of Christ says, now. Until then, don't be discouraged. Do what you're called to do. Be patient. Keep doing what He's called you to do. Because right now, the reality is we have to deal with, number two, this physical state of the kingdom. That's the spiritual state of the kingdom. Jesus addresses it first because the encouragement is, it's going on. It is going on. The physical state of the kingdom. Verse 30. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God, or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches, so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. And this is controversial, because there are those who say, see, this represents great kingdom growth. The mustard seed started out with just a handful of believers in the first century. And boom, look at the growth of the church. And it's been massive and and fantastic kingdom growth from small beginnings. Here's the problem with that perspective. A farmer listening to Jesus say this might wonder if Jesus got it wrong. Because a farmer in the Middle East, as Jesus is teaching, would have understood the mustard plant does not grow this way. There are mustard plants throughout the Middle East, throughout Israel. You drive around, we see them along the side of the road. If you go on the next Israel trip, which, by the way, is a year from this March, right? Lord willing, and the saints don't rise, a year from this March, 2014, we're going back. But you drive around and you see mustard plants. You know what they look like? They're they're little shrubs. They're spindly, spiny little things. They are not strong enough to hold a bird's nest, much less to give shade. That's not what the mustard seed does. So the picture's not right. Well, Jesus wasn't a farmer, so maybe he just didn't understand how, you know, plants work. Okay. He created the plants. So he knows how they work, but something's amiss. In this picture he's giving of the physical state of the kingdom, the visible kingdom, 
What he is portraying here, gang, is a vast, indiscriminate, all-inclusive, powerful, world-domineering organization, a global church that is not concerned with truth so much as numbers. It does not reflect the quiet spiritual growth of the previous parable. And what fills this mustard tree? It's something evil. It is something satanic. It is something foul. Birds. Which is why it's foul. It's a foul in the mustard plant. Foul birds. Birds foul. I'm not just winging it up here, okay? What would you say? Angry birds. Angry birds. <laughs> That's what it is. They're angry birds. Oh. We need to move on or we're going to get in a flap over this. When I taught on this same parable, back when we were in Matthew, there were those who thought I was a little hard on our fine feathered friends who, uh, because I compared them to agents of evil. I'm pretty sure at the time that... Uh, When we were studying Matthew, one pooped on my notes. I'm not sure, but I I, I think I remember that. And they don't teach you that stuff in Bible college. They really don't. How do you wipe it off and keep going? You know. Birds in the barn. That that bugged me. So I made a big deal about that. They're evil. It's evil birds, you know. And the birds are evil here in the parable. And and I had some people go, yeah, how, how can you say that the birds are evil? You know, I got some cute little chirping birds in a cage at home, and they're just sweet. How, how do you make them evil? Well, I didn't. Jesus did. You need to look back at verse 4 of chapter 4. In the first parable, which is the context of all of these parables he was teaching right out front, as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the roads, and the birds came and ate it up. The only example in the context we here have of the birds is evil. Because when Jesus describes the seed being eaten on the side of the road, who does he say eats the seed? Satan. The birds are a picture of Satan and of something demonic. So now all of a sudden you say, all right, now there are birds that are perching in this unnatural mustard tree. It is not the way that a typical mustard seed grows. And there are birds there, and they are representing something evil. And these birds really are foul. And I mean that literally. They represent demonic things. And yet they're in they're in the church? How's that work? They're actually nesting in the physical kingdom. Matthew gives us further context for this. If that's not enough for you, and let me explain it even further because I'm not just again <laughs> winging it here. Matthew 13:24 through 43, read it when you get home. Matthew 13 24 through 43, Jesus actually shares the parable of the mustard seed and the birds in the mustard tree. He shares it in a trilogy of parables. Three parables together, all saying the exact same thing, one after another. And the first parable, he tells, is tares in the wheat. The wheat is good. The tares are bad news. The second parable in the trilogy is birds in the branches of the mustard tree. And the third parable is leaven in the loaf. And some have come along and tried to say the leaven in the loaf, that's a good thing. That's how the kingdom works. It gets in there and it just spreads out. Leaven in the Bible is a picture of sin. Always a picture of sin. The Lord comes along in Leviticus 23. And for Passover, which is followed immediately by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God tells the people of Israel, get all the leaven out of the house. Spring cleaning, you know where that phrase came from? It came from Jewish people cleaning the leaven out of the house, getting prepared for Passover. And they would completely, they would use dishes that had not been used all year long so that no leaven could have even touched the the dishes because they understood something. That leaven portrays sin and God says, separate yourselves from sin. Leaven in the loaf, birds in the branches, and tares in the wheat. Tares look like wheat. And in the parable, he says, uh, uh, you know, a man, a, a neighbor of the farmer came in and sowed tares among the wheat and they grew up. So you can't tell what is the good wheat from the bad. You know when you can tell? At harvest time, because the wheat actually has heads of grain on it, while as the tares have nothing. And Jesus says, you leave that alone. You let it go all the way to the harvest. All the way to the harvest, Lord? Yeah, that means in the visible kingdom that the tares are growing up right alongside the wheat. That the church will have issues. 
that there's going to be evil, there's going to be sin, there will be problems in the church. As the church is growing massively in the world, there's sin in the visible kingdom, sin in the church, and it will culminate, listen, in a massive, mustardy, global church. And the birds are going to come home to roost. We um, <laughs> we went out and purchased some stupid chickens. I'll tell you what, I don't have a whole lot of farm experience. These chickens are the dumbest animals I've ever seen in my life. Okay, they're all in this little chicken house, this coop, down at the Adelots. They've got this big chicken coop on their property, and so we put our chickens in with theirs. There's 18 chickens in there, and right now we're averaging about two eggs a day. And I threatened them. I said, I'm going to come down there with a shotgun and blow one of their little heads off. <laughs> I'm going to tell the rest I'm taking out one chicken an hour until some of you start laying. They're just, they're just dumb chickens. And we've been learning things that I never thought we would learn about how to help chickens do their job. You know, what do you need for the chickens to lay the eggs that they need to lay? And one of the things we learned is they will not lay when the nest is a mess you got to clean it for them because they're too dumb to do it themselves. You know? It's amazing. And I thought about that in reading this. I thought, you know what? That is just like the church. We are only productive when the nest is clean. Otherwise, we're not producing. If there's filth, if there's grime in the nest, we don't produce. We can't produce in this world. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1.15, As obedient children do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And Peter quotes Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. You're holy, because I am holy. That's how the church is supposed to be. That's what's going on in the spiritual state of the kingdom. But in the physical state of the kingdom, we got all kinds of things. We got parades of homosexuals with big signs saying, Jesus loves me. And, and you know what? He does. But he doesn't love the behavior. It's abomination to him. There are many things going on in the larger church body that are just not of the Lord. There's a lot of tares in the wheat, birds in the branches, Leaven in the loaf. But the harvest is coming. And don't forget, the blade, the head, and the grain, they're growing up. And God is doing that, and He will bring the harvest. In fact, Matthew 13, 30, He says to the reapers, First gather up the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into My barn. And that's the promise. So verse 33, with many such parables, He was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it. Which I don't know, does that mean 20 minute sermons? I was told that in Bible college. Don't preach longer than 20 minutes because you'll lose them and they won't hear it. Oops. (laughs) Verse 34, and he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. Don't miss this. He's explaining everything privately to his own disciples, literally expounding everything. The word is epiluo in the Greek, and it means to unloose or untie. So he would tell the parable, get alone with the apostles, and then he would untie it and lay it out before them. The other Greek word you got to note here is privately. He is talking privately. He's Unloosing, expounding, explaining everything privately to his own disciples. The word privately is kata idios, which is not where we get our word idiot, okay? Don't confuse it. It's where we get our word individual. <coughs> because kata idios means with his own individually. And Woos says what he's talking about where he says with his own is literally the apostles, not just a bunch of disciples, but the twelve specifically. When he got alone with the twelve, Mark 4.34 in the King James translates really nicely. It says, when they were alone, he expounded all these things to his disciples. So don't miss this. It's when he expounds or illuminates all things to us. When? When we get alone with him. When we stop and we listen. These were private Jesus conferences. How marvelous. 
They got to hear the teaching, try and take it in and figure it out, and then they got to sit with Jesus and He explained everything to them. And most often this would happen in the evening. After all the crowds went away, they all went home in the evening. Lord, what did you mean? Tell us more. Reproductive hearts. Their hearts were soft and pliable. And they wanted more. They couldn't get enough Jesus. Tell us more, Lord. And again, these things often happened in the evening after the dust of the day had settled, after the crowds were gone. It's what you're doing right now. They come in the evening. You get alone. You get out of the world. That's cool, by the way. We're not hiding out. But we are getting away. We are getting alone with Jesus to hear His words. His teaching, to let it really sink in deep. And evening's a great time to do that. But it's only one night a week. Is it enough for you? Evening is a great time to get alone with the Lord, open up the Bible, and ask Him to expound His Word to you more fully. Wait a minute, Rick. You recently said we need to meet with the Lord in the morning, and now I got to meet with Him in the evening too? Yes. What marvelous bookends to the perfect day to begin in the morning with prayer, listening to the Lord and seeking His agenda, and then to end the day in the evening in biblical exposition, Bible study, reading the Word of the Lord. Begin hearing from the Lord and being with the Lord. But, but only do this if you want Jesus to expound the mysteries of the kingdom to you. If you're not interested in that, by all means, go on to bed. Verse 33, or verse 35, let me just end this out here for us. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And if you've seen the the Jesus boat they have in Israel, you know this is not a big boat. This is perhaps from where Spencer is sitting to perhaps about the chair on the other side. Right? Is that about right? You guys have seen it? And probably about as wide as from where I'm sitting to about the second row, maybe. That's about the size of the boat. Twelve guys plus Jesus asleep in the stern. And he's not down in the hold in a nice little cabin with windows. He's on a cushion on top in the stern. And the waves are just rocking. And the rain's coming down and the wind is blowing. He's sound asleep. He's totally at peace. On a cushion. And they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, and I can imagine him rubbing the sleep out of his eyes, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this rabbi on a rowboat? Now note this, the only thing I want to say about this story. We started with Jesus in the boat teaching. We end with Jesus in the boat and he's still teaching. Only right now you might call this storm an apostolic pop quiz. (laughs) All the things they had learned, all that they had learned from Jesus, understood from him all day long, now have a pretty dramatic application. They have a test to see how well they listened. And we're going to talk more about that on Sunday. Let's stand up together. The Father, we praise you for all these things. We bless the name of the Lord. We are so uh, just in awe of you. Father, in awe of your word, we consider these things precious. This seed, this is precious seed that you have sprinkled on our hearts tonight. And Father, I pray that we would have open hearts to receive. Lord, not not hard pan hearts that miss Jesus. I hope, Lord, that we all have seen Jesus tonight. And certainly not rocky hearts to take a shallow approach and then head out the door. Not restrictive hearts, Lord, that are so caught up with the cares that are waiting for us at home. 
But Father, may we have reproductive hearts. I pray for what I do not understand. I ask for what I do not know, and that is I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how you germinate the seed of your word in our hearts, but I know you do. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will. I ask for each and every one of us that we might experience the crop of 30 or 60 or 100 more people, Lord, who know Jesus because of your word germinating in our hearts. We lift you up, Jesus Christ, and we praise your name. And we ask all of these things in your name. Amen.